Okay, I've been using this laptop here for like the past year, year and a half, and it's been pretty good. i5 13th gen 1440p, it cost me $650. This costs 10 times that. And I'm going to be using this for the next 13 days. Let's see how I do. For a bit of context, this is the HP ZBook Ultra G1A. All things considered, not the worst model name in the world. Now, if you're like me, you're probably familiar with two types of laptops. Consumer grade and gaming laptops. And then there's the weird kid in the corner, the mobile workstations. This is one of those weird kids. I mean, it is total overkill in every single department from the build, the price, the specs. But I do want to see what it's like to use something this high end in everyday life. Okay, so I have been playing around with the laptop now for a few hours and right off the bat, the G1A is just like really well built. My other HP laptop is also aluminum, but this just feels so much more premium. It's like a more dense metal, if that makes sense. I have just set it up with Windows Hello and installing a few updates here and there. I will start loading it up with Office, Excel, not Chrome, because it chews up too much RAM, but Maybe some benchmarking software, a game or two, I don't know which ones yet though, but yeah, over the next few days I'm just going to settle in with it, and yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, day two. Still not enough time to have like a full opinion on this thing yet, but here's a few things I have noticed with it early on. Firstly, you should not be considering this laptop if you're just the average Joe responding to the emails and watching YouTube. I mean, this thing is just way too overspecced for that kind of stuff. Ryzen AI Max Pro 390, the middle child between the weaker 385 and 395, a terabyte of storage, and a honking 64 gigs of DDR5. I will do some actual benchmarks later on, but for everyday tasks, the G1A just absolutely smokes through them. I'm talking 20 browser tabs open, a spreadsheet or two, Spotify, and a pre-recorded uni lecture all going on at once, and you're still gonna have more than half your RAM available. I normally have all the RAM saving features enabled in Edge, but I can literally just turn all those off and not have to worry about them. I do want to try some light 4K editing in Premiere Pro, maybe tomorrow when I have the time, but I mean, this thing is just crazy. Okay, I have been running the G1A docked most of today in my laptop setup, mostly because I wanna use my larger 27 inch monitor but also because the screen included in this spec of the G1A is, let's just say, unremarkable. It's a 14 inch 1200p 60Hz IPS panel, maxing out at just 400 nits for SDR content. For context, Apple's MacBooks hit at least 600, and nearly double that for HDR content. The 16 to 10 aspect ratio is nice, giving some extra real estate to use, but I can't help but compare to my much cheaper Pavilion Plus. That laptop is sporting double the refresh rate and a higher resolution at just a tenth of the price. Admittedly, I am one of those people who do like to pixel peep and clown my brother's 1080p display, and so far, the G1A isn't looking too good. Literally. HP is most likely betting on their users doing what I've done, that is, docking it and using external monitors, which is fair, but this thing costs more than my car. It especially hurts since the build quality and slim profile make it feel like it's made for travel. Still, you do at least get 100% sRGB coverage, which should be good enough for any on-the-fly editing or streaming. For these videos, I don't do any crazy color grading or processing S-Log footage, so no complaints in this regard. Okay, that's enough study for today. I'm gonna call it there. I will check back in in a few days time, once I've had a bit more one time with the G1A. I have been using the G1A for the past five days now, and the price tag is still fresh on my mind, but you do start to appreciate all the smaller things that make the experience that much better. 
than using a cheaper laptop. Before we start, one thing I did forget to mention back in day 2 were the different screen specs you can choose from. We have the base model screen, that being the IPS 60Hz one, but there are 4 options available. If you have the dough, you can go up to a 2.8K touchscreen OLED 120Hz panel with 100% DCI-P3 coverage, which is going to be right up there amongst the best of the best in a laptop. The IPS panel isn't outright terrible by any means, but you do have better options available if you want them. Okay, back to it. For one, the port selection on the G1A is really quite good. HDMI 2.1, USB 3.2 Gen 2, and Thunderbolt 4, capable of 150 watt charging. Your combo jack, then on the right side, another TB4, a USB-A, and a Kensington lock. The way I have my desk setup done is laptop on the left and monitor on the right, whilst Justin has his the other way around. Having a Thunderbolt port on either side means the G1A is at home in either setup, which is like such a small thing but so very convenient. I have been having some fun with the 5 megapixel infrared camera and the preloaded poly camera software, which actually takes some pretty decent looking videos and photos by laptop camera standards. There's even the cute little physical privacy toggle, which is cool to see. And if you're into it, you're gonna find all the AI enhanced features like spotlight, face tracking, all that kind of stuff. The power button also doubles as a fingerprint reader, so that was handy too. No issues there. And the keyboard. It's pretty dang good. I love the way it types, and I can get decently up to speed with it. With the G1A being a 14 inch, you won't find a numpad on this, but I don't really mind, so that's fine. The page up and down keys are kind of squished right next to the left and right arrow keys, which I'm not a fan of, but you get used to it anyway. One surprising thing about the keyboard is the amount of travel the switches have. Because there's so much of it, it doesn't feel the most tactile, but it is super nice to type on, I think just because of how different it is from the other keyboards I've used. Justin and I both kind of obsess over our keyboards, so overall, we were pleasantly surprised with this keyboard. It does also have backlighting, which doesn't get the brightest, but y'all should be touch typing anyway. When I haven't been using the G1A hooked up to my setup, I have been using the trackpad a whole lot, and immediately, I can tell you, it's a major step up from my other, much cheaper laptop. I mean, for one, it's a lot bigger, and it's not crazy loud either. The clicks almost feel cushioned in a way, which I think takes away from its tactility, which Justin likes, but I think I prefer a more solid bottom out. And it's not a haptic trackpad like MacBooks and other laptops, but that's more down to personal preference. Okay, and a few closing thoughts on the speakers. The G1A does feature four stereo speakers, two top firing ones on the deck itself, and two underneath, so it's not blasting all the sound into the desk where your ears aren't. Are they MacBook level quality? I'll say probably not, but they do get plenty loud without distorting. Not much bass to them, but definitely more than serviceable. And that is day 5 in the books. I'll be honest, the more I use the G1A, the more I kind of realise I can get 80-85% of the same experience with a laptop that's a tenth of the price. And I know I've spent the last few minutes hyping it up, and what I've said for the most part does still hold. But is the G1A really worth six and a half thousand dollars? Well, I'll be doing some actual benchmarks over the next few days. The performance is something I haven't fully tested yet. I don't know, the G1A is an interesting device. Okay, Justin here to talk about the performance. Over the past few days, I've been running some benchmarks on the G1A, and I've gotten some interesting results. Back near the start of April, Chris and I were lucky enough to attend the launch event here in Sydney, and though HP was obviously pushing its professional workload handling capabilities, they did also have an entire sim racing setup playing F124. So that's exactly what we've tested. A wide range of applications, including your more traditional benchmarks, to games, to actual AI models. Here's how the G1A performed. G1 
Just remember, we have the variants with the AI Max Pro 390. Starting off with good old 3 d Mark, where we went through a couple of CPU and GPU benchmarks. In Times By, we got a graphics score of 8652, and running Steel Nomad DX12 got us a score of 1634. Keep in mind, this is running at native resolution, the laptop in performance mode and plugged in. To put this score into perspective, you're looking at gaming performance roughly on par with a mobile RTX 4050 or even a desktop 3060. Not the greatest to be honest, but then again, gaming isn't really the main focus of this laptop anyway. Next up, Geekbench 6.4. We got a single core score of 2811 and a multi-core score of 16482. This places the AI Max Pro 390 single core performance right below an Apple Silicon M3 Max CPU and its multi-core performance closer to Intel's mobile Core Ultra 9. In Geekbench AI 1.3, we achieved the following scores. Honestly, Geekbench's comparison tool for the AI benchmarks isn't very intuitive and actually finding and comparing these scores was rather difficult. So if you're thinking about this laptop, I trust you know what these mean. Now, moving on to Blender 4.4, the ZBook ran a score of 338, 0.8 points higher than an Apple M4 Pro. So yeah, not just good, but actually beating out some of the best chips out there, which is what you'd expect. And the last synthetics test we ran was Cinebench 24, where single core performance yielded a score of 110 points, close to an Apple M1 Max chip, or a desktop grade Ryzen 7, 7800X30. Multi-core performance however, with 1320 points, sits just 2 points lower than a 9800X3D 9, chip, one of AMD's best. Next, we boosted up one of my own favourite games, RDR2, and ran the in-game benchmark. Using Digital Foundry's console settings, which is a nice balance between visuals and performance, we averaged about 95 frames per second. We then pushed it a bit further, everything on high with textures on ultra, and that brought the average closer to still very playable 80 frames per second. We were actually running these benchmarks back to back for about an hour, just to see how it held up. And good news, basically no sign of thermal throttling. The fans do get noticeably loud pretty fast, and their chassis definitely warms up, but nothing really too bad. HP's thermal solution in the ZBook seems to be doing the trick just fine. Chris did manage to do some 4K video editing on the G1A, on battery power mainly, and it held its own. No fancy After Effects compositions with a thousand layers, but just more general YouTube video style projects. This is where the 64GB of RAM really came in handy. Pre-rendering longer timelines was a breeze, and it also meant multitasking with multiple apps open wasn't an issue. The screen on the G1A is a little too small to work on for longer periods of time, but performance wise, it's really more than capable of at least basic editing workloads. Moving on. Lastly, to really test and take advantage of the NPU and 64GB of RAM, we handed the reins over to an actual software engineer and let him have it for the day. In his testing, he found the experience surprisingly smooth with the VS Code, Android Studio, including the emulator, and even a local Llama 3.17b chatbot running simultaneously, there was virtually zero lag. He was also downloading large files, compiling apps, and utilizing the chatbot for code, all at once, and the ZBook managed it with ease. Even the fans stayed quiet most of the time. He also said the combination of sheer processing power and energy efficiency genuinely made his app development process faster and easier. In the end, he was pretty impressed with both the performance and the overall responsiveness of the system. So long story short, that AI moniker in the Max Pro 390 is actually doing some heavy lifting here. Okay, so benchmarks are done and it's the end of day 8. We've got some solid metrics and numbers to show for, and I think we've pretty much covered the bulk of the G1A. For myself personally, it's been a fun few days using a laptop of this caliber and price tag, and I could genuinely see this being a really powerful tool in the right hands. Day 9. I only have a few more days now with the G1A before we have to hand it back off to HP, but this thing hasn't skipped a beat. 
Admittedly, I haven't been doing that much gaming or editing on the machine. It is almost exam season, so I've got better things to do. But there is one area which I haven't talked about yet, and that's battery life. I could only feel comfortable talking about it after I had, you know, put it through its paces and settled in with it, which I have at this point, so here goes. Battery life is just okay. The G1A is packing a 74.5 watt hour 4 cell, which in theory sounds pretty great, but we are pairing that with one of the most powerful APUs on the market. With that being said, I managed only 5, 5.5 five hours of screen on time, with brightness on medium, all the default background stuff running. Yeah, not too good. Again, I'm not some crazy power user pushing this thing to its limits, I'm just your average Joe doing average computer stuff. When my brother was using the G1A to do his AI stuff, yeah, this thing would have died within 2 hours or so when at full tilt. You will want to be plugged in, just like any other laptop, for the best possible experience and performance. I was definitely expecting a bit more juice though, and this seems to be the general experience with Ryzen AI Max chips and laptops. I mean, it does kind of make sense though, the Max Pro 390 in this boosts up to 120 watts from a 55 watt TDP. For reference, the i5-1335U in my other laptop has a TDP of just 15 watts. Fortunately, charge times are pretty good using the 140 watt charger, which is definitely handy when you do push the system really hard. It is a bit chunky though, so I do always have my 65 watt 30 amp power, power bank for on the go. But yeah, the G1A and the charger combined for just over 2 kilos, so keep that in mind. So battery life isn't perfect, but again, this thing is as powerful as some of the newer gaming laptops out there. And no one in their right mind is playing Cyberpunk with RT Overdrive on battery life anyway, so there is that. Just 4 days to go now, I'll let you know if anything changes. It is the final day of using the G1A. Um, I have to wipe it tonight and get it ready to send back to HP, but it's been an interesting two weeks. When Justin and I first got the G1A in, I'll be honest, I didn't really know what to expect with a laptop so expensive. I mean, owning this thing practically doubled my net worth on the spot. This is a joke, but you get my point. So what are my thoughts on the workstation experience? Workstations are built for one thing, and that's performance on the go. Well, if we're being realistic, aesthetics as well. Say you're in the market for a laptop that's capable of running AAA titles at a respectable frame rate. There's a niche carved out for that. Gaming laptops. Are they often kinda ugly and bulky and loud? In more cases than not, yeah. They are getting better, but there's always the game aesthetic there. Now, say you're in the market for a laptop for an office environment and won't break your back lugging it around. Consumer laptops, your MacBook Airs, Yogas, XPSs, what have you. Are they going to break a sweat running a Minesweeper? No. But they're not going to be hosting massive local chatbots either. And that's where laptops like the G1A come in. Gaming laptop performance for people who just don't play games. That's pretty much it. And there is the other stuff as well. The AMD Pro security suite, HP Wolf security, all that kind of stuff businesses would want. You can check out our DIN article on the launch event down below, which has a bit more of the technical specs. And that's why 90% of ZBook owners are going to be businesses. People who need that grunt on the go, but aren't lining up for the gamer RGB and massive cooling solutions from your Alienwares, Razors and RGs. The G1A is not a consumer laptop, I mean, it's priced accordingly, you're paying a premium to get the best of both worlds. And that's why I'm happy to go back to my good old Pavilion Plus, that's a tenth of the price. For the average user, there's just too much performance overhead, even with lower spec options with the G1A, but if you know what you're looking for, the G1A is a solid option. That's the video, thanks for watching.